an heir, an heir, an heir of Jesus. Remember we said you're not an heir because of who you are or what you've done. You're an heir because of who Jesus is and what he has done. That's right. That was good news. Yes, it is. Uh, so this morning I want to look a little bit closer at this idea of being a, what I'm going to call joined together heir. Scripture talks about being joint heirs with Jesus. That's uh, that's a lot different than than uh, being a Christian. Let's say uh, by association or a uh, Christian in name only. But if you're if you're joined together with Jesus, I mean Paul is really strong on that. I mean that is the key verse of Galatians in verses uh, chapter two, twenty, where he says, "I've been." Crucified with Christ. I mean, that's not just a, a, a picture or a, or a good uh, bumper sticker phrase. But uh, he believes that is literally what happens to us in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly realms. That somehow, some way, Jesus and us join together in that oneness that Jesus prayed about in the garden, John 17, that we would be one Father, as you are in me and I in you, that they may all be one in us, joined together heir, joint heirs with Jesus. So in thinking about that being joint heirs, with Jesus or a joined together heir. Let's look at that, that proposition this morning. And uh, it says this, if you're, not a, if you're not a Christian joined together in Christ alone, if you're not a Christian joined together in Christ alone, then, then you're really a, just a Christian in name only. And of course we could debate that whether you can really be a Christian in name only. We, I don't think many of us believe that. Well, I'm a Christian. Yeah, well, how come? Well, I got a membership card that says I'm a Christian. Not if you look at Galatians 2.20 carefully, you cannot be a Christian in name only. But just for the sake of understanding what it means to be joined together. If you're not a Christian joined together in Christ alone, then you're really just a Christian in, in name only. I mean, we have that today in our... Uh, in the political realm, we have those that are called rhinos, that uh, big term that's been coming up lately. Uh, you're a Republican in name only. <laughs> Maybe the Democrats have that too, a dino. Whoa. Democrat in name only, I don't know. Uh, but if you are something in name only, then you're really aren't that something, are you? Wow. If it's just in name only. It's just, just my name. Just my tag. You know, and, it, and that can go a lot of places where we probably don't need to go this morning. But uh, something like uh, Patriot Church, which I hear is coming to town, m may go there and could help them train you there. So uh, beware of that. Keep looking for the signs. I hear they're coming, coming to a church near you. So, uh, if you, so if you're not a Christian joined together in Christ alone, then you're really just a Christian <clears throat> in name only. You know, and the same thing holds true about this whole concept of being being an heir. So look, let's look at that again, Galatians chapter three. We're going to start there, and we're going to back up a couple of more verses this morning than we started last week because of this one. This is intimacy. Great song we we sang this morning. Especially that first one is one of my favorite ones. How great God is. Uh, so uh, Galatians chapter 3, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning in verse 26. For you are all sons and daughters of God through Christ, through our faith in Christ Jesus. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So in Christ, we are one. In Christ alone, we are one. Not in name only, 
but in Christ alone, in Him, and Him in us. That, that mysterious, miraculous transformation that takes place makes us one. And look how Paul explains it. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have been have sunk into, have been immersed in Christ. You have put on Christ. So again, again, it's more than a, a badge that says my name is, but to put on, to sink into Christ. That you have sunk into him and, and he has sunk into you. And again, we know what that looks like. We know what, what that means. We've all been accosted by a, a flu or a virus bug. And when that bug has come into us, somehow that bug has sunk into us. And next thing you know, you got a runny nose. And next thing you know, you got a headache. And next thing you know, you got a fever. And next thing you know, you got a cough. And that bug transforms you from being what you were, a healthy thing, to now a sickly thing. You know what that means. You know what that's like. So take that in a positive view <clears throat> as Christ comes into us, where you become a new creation. A new creation. Then he goes on, he says, Therefore there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Right. Yeah. In Christ alone. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So there's the heir again. You are an heir according to the promise. Because of Christ, if you're in Christ, then you are linked into the promise that was given to Abraham because Christ is Abraham's seed. That's what he said back in chapter 3, verse 16. That Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say into seeds as of many, but as of one. Christ alone, one, as to your seed, who is Christ? Galatians 3.16. Got it? Good. Yes. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, becoming heirs. Right? And because you are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God, through, excuse me, through Christ. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. So again, he's giving that picture of the transformation. Before you knew God, you served those things which were not God. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. So again, <clears throat> he's going back to what he said in the beginning of chapter 3 about these foolish Galatians. Why are they turning away so soon? Back to chapter 1, right? <clears throat> Why are you turning away so soon? From the grace, right? That's called you. And then chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should should not obey the truth, whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. If, if there ever was a day and a time that we needed to study, to show ourselves approved, if you ever needed to not just listen to a particular channel on TV and buy into a particular narrative or message and do your homework and do research 
Today is the day, ladies and gentlemen. Today is the day that you... I'm going to have to sneeze, sorry. Today is the day that you just cannot take what Google says, take what your favorite news channel says, and take it as the gospel truth. Take that which you hear and immerse it into Jesus and His Word. Yes. Mm. Because I don't know if you know or not, but persecution is here. It is now here. If you are a Christian, you are being persecuted now. That's right. And if you're not being persecuted, I'm wondering if you're just a Christian in name only. Wow. Wow. I'm wondering if you're really joined together in Christ alone. And the interesting thing is about this persecution. When the persecutor comes, he doesn't really care if you're a Christian, although he likes to persecute Christians. But whoever's in that particular area gets persecuted too. Hmm. For instance, some recent persecutions. There's a young boy. I don't know if he was a Christian or not. But his, his liberties were persecuted. He was sitting in a restaurant, a teenage boy, you may have heard about it. He had a particular hat on his head. It happened to be a red hat. It happened to be a patriotic red hat. Huh. And some 30-year-old man with a record, who was now in jail, came up to that teenage boy, ripped the hat off his head, threw a drink at him, and proceeded to persecute him for his beliefs. Now, I thought we lived in America where we could proclaim our beliefs. If you wanted to believe in a tree, hey, I'll leave you alone. You go worship the tree. But persecution has now come to our country. And it's alive and well now. There is a battle going on. You've probably heard about the, the bakery person that was been persecuted because they decided they didn't want to bake a cake for a particular reason and it was a religious reason thought we had first amendment rights now it's like the highlights on TV now people can't even go to dinner without being persecuted. Whoa. Because a group of persecutors has decided that they're going to resist and come against what you believe. Be it conservative or religious or godly or whatever. Those who have said that they have become these, uh, this group of uh, everyone's welcome now has stated that, oh no, if you don't believe like we do, then we're against you. And that was never what the Founding Fathers said. That's not what our Constitution says. Because as point one states, persecution proclaims. Persecution proclaims who and whose you are. And it doesn't matter which side of persecution you're on, it will proclaim who and whose you are. If you are the one persecuting someone else, hey, we know exactly who and whose you are. And if you are the one who is under persecution, we may also know by your response to that persecution who and whose you are. I mean, when it comes to these levels of, uh, of government folks like... Uh, our press secretary, that's what her title is, right? We know she's a Christian. We know her daddy's a Christian. She was asked to leave a restaurant because she works for our president. Hmm. If that doesn't come under the lines of oh, a new word. ludicrosity, Whoa. it's ludicrous, I'm Whoa. telling you. It's absolutely ludicrous, what you talked about a few weeks ago. 
If that's not ludicrous, if that's not craziness, and it happened again to another. And it's happening it's not just to guys, it's happening to women. Oh, wow. Happened to our Health and Human Services director. She was out with her family, and they came to her at a quiet dinner and proceeded to call her out. That's free speech? That's okay? I'm not sure. Persecution proclaims. Now let's go back for a second. As we look at this idea of this joint heir being joined together with Jesus, Paul again tries to explain it in the book of Romans, chapter 8. Remember we said Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. You need to look at those together. Of course, Romans 5 is the justification chapter, how you are justified by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace through God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You're justified. Your salvation begins. Chapter 6 again. We call that the, uh, the sanctification chapter, if you will, where Paul asks us this question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. This is part of that persecution proclaims. One of the other things that's really bothering me in these last days is that all of these Christians, I'll say all of us Christians, put us together, who are not living in the power, who are not living in this joined-together airness, if you will. This standing in Christ alone. There's a whining and complaining and, <clears throat> and, 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 I, and I sin and continue to sin and I can't help myself and where is the power of this, this resurrected power? Where is the, the power of the promise that's been given? Mm. See, when the persecution knocks on your door, what's the proclamation going to be from us? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. I mean, I hear it in the songs even. It's like, once a sinner, always a sinner. That doesn't seem to make sense in Scripture. It's like, well, I'm saved. Am I saved in, in name only? Am I a Christian in name only? Or have I truly entered into this joined heirs with Jesus? It's Paul strong in chapter 8 when we get there. He's strong on it. Again, here's this picture that he talks about in Galatians. Therefore, verse 4, if we were buried with him through baptism into death, then just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. This promise, the promise of the Father, indwells within us when we walk in this newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Isn't that what he was getting at back in Galatians? To redeem those, Galatians 4 or 5, that we might receive the adoption of sons and daughters. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Jesus Christ. The promise indwells. 
If you've received the promise, you are indwelled by the Spirit of Jesus. Again, he goes into chapter 7. He gives again this picture of what it looks like when sin dwells in me, he says in Romans 7, 17. Sin that dwells in me. Now if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So we've got to get past this, this breakdown in our Christian truth. That somehow, some way, that I can continue to be a Christian and continue to sin in word, thought, and deed daily. That's not a Christian joined together in Christ alone. That's a Christian who says, I'm a Christian in name only. Denying the power. Not being transformed by the resurrected power of the Holy Spirit. Now as you move into chapter 8, you see this promise that indwells. How does he start out chapter 8? Verse 1, there, therefore, there is therefore no, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Right. Don't stop there. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. You're free. Amen. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, for those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. I'm sick and tired of Christians saying, well, yeah, well, I was in the flesh. What, do you know what you mean when you say that? Do you mean in the flesh, or do you mean you were carnal? Because if we keep on reading, which we will, this flesh and this carnal nature are two different things. That's right. Jesus came in sinful flesh, it said, but he did not sin, did he? Amen. For those who live, this is chapter 8, verse 5 of Romans, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Woo. For to be carnally minded is death. death. So tell me how you can be a carnal Christian. Uh. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Not this flesh, the self-centered carnal nature. When we are self-centered, when we are carnally minded, we cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, the promise in dwells. That's a good thing. When the promise in dwells you, when the Spirit of God in dwells you, you are being transformed. You cannot stay the same. The Spirit of God is dwelling within you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, what's it say? He is not his. Well, I'm a Christian. Yeah? Yeah. Well, how do you know? Well, I, I, got, a, I got a card. It says I'm a Christian. I got a name tag. It says I'm a Christian. But do you have the Spirit of Christ? Well, no, but 
then then you're a Christian in name only. Wow. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit of his life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who what? Dwells in you. The promise in dwells. Praise the Lord. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Which is what Paul's getting back at at Galatians. Why are you going back to your old ways? You've been liberated. You've been set free. The chains have been broken. Why do you want to go back to the bondage again? Are you that bored? Huh. Are you that forgetful? Have you been that deceived? Wow. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Said the same thing in Galatians, didn't it? Yeah. Verse 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. God. Isn't that the kicker that got old John Wesley on the boat? Well, hey, uh, Mr. Wesley, I know there's a storm about this brewing here. I know the boat's about to crash, but you see this group of us, we're singing hymns and praises over here. Why are you cowering over in the corner? Why are you afraid? Does not your spirit and God's spirit line up together? Does not his spirit bear witness with your spirit to proclaim to you that you are a child of God? And old Mr. Wesley back then couldn't answer that question. So old Peter Bowler. Until his heart was strangely warmed. And he became joined together in Christ alone. They are on altars listening to the preface of all books, Romans. Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and what? Joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we what? Suffer with him, that we also be, may also be glorified together. Persecution proclaims. These all go together. The promise indwells. And the paraclete bears witness. The Spirit. The Comforter. The Helper. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that's to rule and reign in your life. Amen. Glorified together. Joint heirs with Jesus Indeed, we suffer with him. Maybe we should start reading our uh, Book of Martyrs all the time now to remind us of this persecution that is here, that is alive, that is well, that wants to stifle you and squelch you and shut you up and come against you. I mean, I mean, how crazy is it getting now when a, when a professing socialist has been elected in her party to run against, to run in November? A socialist? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, socialism is not good. It is contrary to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Yes. Don't let anybody tell you anything different, but go ahead and do your own work. If socialism was so good, uh, maybe we should all take a working witness to Venezuela to see how it's going over there. No. If things were so good, why are they climbing over our borders to get here?
Mm. And if children, err, 16, go back to 16 again. The Spirit Himself bears witness. The paraclete bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. When that Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, bears witness within you. You are not a Christian in name only. You are a Christian because you have been joined together in Christ alone. Yeah. Mm. Nice. And join heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. The battle is here. The persecution is here. The attacks are here. Study to show yourself approved. Immerse yourself into Jesus and His Word. Bathe yourself in His presence all the day long. Be ready in season and out of season. All the things we've talked about over these years. And now, we're getting ready to put it into practice. We're getting ready Proclaim the truth that has set us free. But know this in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. These persecutors in our day today, many of them are proclaimed to be Christian. Many of them have been quoting scripture, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Those who are Christian in name only, or Christian when it suits them, May we not be those kind of Christians in name only when it suits us. Because it might be easy to, to be a Christian working at Chick-fil-A, but maybe you don't think you can be a Christian where you work. Well, guess what? You were placed there to be a light in that dark workplace you may be in. You cannot be a Christian in name only. We are only Christian we are when we are joined together in Christ alone. And some of these Christians who are persecuting other Christians for the sake of tolerance and all this other political correctness. I was trying to think of that, find that quote to close with from a, uh, 
a justice from a, a current, I guess it's a court of appeals judge. One in particular is the, the woman who's up for possible choosing. Tony Barrett. She told a group of graduates at a Notre Dame commencement when they graduated law school. I gotta paraphrase it because I can't find the quote, but she basically said. that their purpose in life was more than this law degree that they just received. That their purpose was more than just being attorneys and good attorneys. That they could somehow be change agents effective in the world around them if they would understand you found it that's good nice thank you man cool so it was a and I talked to Notre Dame graduates, 2006. She report, a transcript report, reportedly showed her saying this, quote, a legal career is but a means to an end. And that end is building the kingdom of God, she said. Wow. If you can keep in mind that your fundamental purpose in life is not to be a lawyer, but to know, love, and serve God, you truly can be a different kind of lawyer. Awesome. Now, there is a group awesome. of people who think that is just blasphemy <laughs> to the Constitution. Whoa. But if you go back, we look at the Constitution, and we read this quote by James Madison, who many would call what? The, the author, right? of the Constitution. Certainly one of the founders. He said this. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. Awesome. Amen. John Adams. Yeah. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. So if you read what Madison said, or John Adams says, and line that up with the, what this judge says, what she says is not out of line. Amen. What she says doesn't mean she's going to not follow the Constitution. She knows how our Constitution came to be. It was made only for a moral and religious people. So if you are immoral and not religious, then the Constitution is not going to make much sense to you. You're not going to like the Constitution. Matter of fact, you're going to try and change the Constitution. And isn't that what's going on today? Uh, uh. The fundamentally transform America. To quote somebody else. Jesus, you are the one who truly transforms. You are the chain breaker. You are the one who sets free. You are the one who liberates. And because of you, Lord Jesus, because of your truth, this nation was founded. Because of you and your truth, because of your word, our declaration of independence, 
being dependent upon you, was written. Because of you, Lord Jesus, our Constitution was created for a moral and religious people. And all of that, because of you, Lord Jesus, we are joint heirs with you, which, which makes us a holy people, a special people. Strengthen us, O oh God, in these last days, we pray. Guard our hearts and guard our minds. Give us great discernment when we are out in the highways and the byways to know the difference between truth and deception. To see others like you see them, Jesus. Help us to be great facilitators of your truth. Empower us to love to encourage, to give hope to all of those we come in contact with. And we truly immerse ourselves into you and your word. So day in and day out, every choice we make, every decision we have, every word we speak, every thought we dwell on, an expression of your indwelling power, your resurrected power, your indwelling presence, an expression of us being joint heirs with you, seated in Christ. We praise you this day. We give you thanks. We trust you, Jesus, that you are still King of kings and Lord of lords. Have your way, we ask and pray. Love you, Jesus.